sovereignty program and I'm also an organic veg grower and seed producer. Um, so today I want to present to you some of the work uh, the seed, pro seed sovereignty program are doing to reinvigorate seed in the UK and Ireland and what better way of doing that than with two new entrant growers who are incredibly passionate about seed, Holly Sylvester and Poppy Nickel. So for those of you who haven't heard about the Seed Sovereignty Programme, we're a regionalised programme working across the UK and Ireland to help growers overcome the challenges to, of a growing, producing and celebrating open pollinated seed. We were set up in direct response to the catastrophic loss of genetic diversity in our agricultural crops. And we've been running for five years now. It's like five years down the line. And we are seeing, yeah, what I see is real change in the hearts, minds and practices of, of growers. So it's quite an exciting time for us as a program. Now, a major part of our work to date has been all about training growers in seed production. And in more recent years, we've, um, through our international seed exchanges and through our seed gathering conference, which is happening this February, in case anyone wants to come, um, we've been seeking to kind of broaden horizons and introduce growers to what I would describe as mind-blowing seed work happening internationally. Um, and this kind of horizon broadening stuff is what we are going to share with you today. Uh, so. The phrase, uh, you can't miss what you've never had, rings really true when I think about seed. Um, in the UK and Ireland, in the last like, generation or two, we become really used to a heavily depleted and hom homogenous seed industry. Um, and this is an issue that particularly affects organic growers because the proportion of organically grown seed is a small part of the, the market. And so the, as the way I see it, we need to look at inspiration from elsewhere, from places with a richer seed saving culture and look at how, the, how we can incorporate those practices into our own businesses and um, projects. And that brings me to our speakers. So we have Poppy Nickel, a new entrant grower and seed saver currently training at Caitan CSA in the Gower, as well as coordinating the Global Gardens Project in Cardiff. She's passionate about CSA and she's going to be talking about her community engagement in, with seed, inspired by the work of the Culinary Breeding Network in the US. Um, she, she'll be followed by Holly Sylvester, who is another new entrant grower currently training at Trill Farm Garden, growing veg crops and commercial seed crops. Uh, she's passionate about bringing genetic diversity back into our food system. And we'll be talking about her work exploring the world of modern land races. I can see you're all pumped and ready to go. <laughs> um, before our speakers start, start um, I like to start, I do this with all of my trainings and um, we do it with our gatherings as well. We start to kind of like set the tone of the session and the conversation and discussions afterwards. We have something called our house rules and these have been taken from uh, the Organic Seed Alliance Conference and I think they're a really helpful uh, way of yeah just, set, just setting the tone. So um, I'm going to read them out and I invite you all to listen and reflect on them and then we'll hear from our speakers and they'll be both talking for about 20 minutes each and then we'll have a bit of time for uh, questions, hopefully. Richard. So, speak only for ourselves and make space for others. Be as present as possible. Be aware of who is missing in each conversation. Remember that no one has a monopoly on truth and everyone's experience is valid. Critique ideas, not people. Listen to our bodies and tend to their needs. Aim for connection, not perfection. That's my favorite one. <laughs> um, so we're gonna have uh, Poppy first and yeah, you can take it away. I'll leave the mic up here. Uh, thanks, Alan. And um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So yeah, my name is Poppy. 
and I'm a grower and seed saver and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing at Global Gardens Project which is a community garden based in Cardiff and my experience of participating in the Seed Sovereignty International Exchanges Programme um, and particularly my um, my kind of experience of participating in the third theme of that, which is all around cultivating celebration and diversity, and how participating in that program kind of inspired some of the activities at Global Gardens. So I'll just give you a little bit of background about Global Gardens Project. Um, so we're located on a number of allotment sites in the centre of Cardiff. Um, about eight allotment sites, which were kind of overgrown and abandoned um, quite brambly, and we took them on about six years ago, seven years ago. Um, and right now, yeah, our key aims are kind of working around promoting approaches to organic gardening, um, but also how to work with produce, so seasonal and nourishing cooking, um, sharing the harvest, just to raise awareness of um, the possibilities of local and seasonal food. And yeah, just as a space for learning more generally. Um, oop, there's a bit of formatting there. But yeah, most of the activities, so we've got um, a range of activities happening at the garden at the moment. So we've got twice weekly volunteer garden sessions, um, twice monthly forest school sessions, and then a range of uh, workshops and courses a lot around um, kind of at the moment it's around climate action and um, we just had a course on edible culture and also um, we're really happy to receive some funding for a series of artist residencies and at the moment we've been doing um, a series of events and festivals around the seasonal calendar so we, we just had one on the autumn equinox and there's going to be one on the Sawain. So yeah, as well as a space for learning, it's also a space for connecting to, right. to the seasons. As, and over the last few years, we've also been doing some work around seed saving. Um, and as well as veg, we grow quite a lot of different uh, medicinal herbs and flowers at the garden. And um, it started really just with a call out for artists who'd like to depict some of the seeds that we're growing um, visually. Uh, but this has turned into kind of, hopefully each year we can expand the artwork that's created, but also the range of seeds that we're saving. So this, um, there's just a series of some images of uh, some of the seed artwork that's been created over the last few years. Um, yeah, that was last year, some beans there. Um, and so that really, the work at Global Gardens um, has really inspired me to want to learn more about growing, which has led me to Kai Tan doing the traineeship there, but also to participating in some of the um, training opportunities that are on offer with the Seeds or Energy program, and specifically applying to take part in the International Exchanges program which I've been doing over the last year. And so, um, as Alan said, that um, yeah, there, there were a range of themes in, uh, in this program. And I um, kind of was drawn to the cultivating celebration and culture theme. And I think the original plan was that we were going to visit some of these sites possibly, <laughs> but unfortunately due to COVID, um, it meant that we had a lot of online Zoom tours of different places. And the one I'm going to talk about now is the Culinary Breeding Network and how that kind of inspired some of the work that, that we've been doing at Global Gardens over the last few months. So there's just a little screenshot of the Zoom call with Lane Salmon um, pre presenting. And yeah, she, she spoke about the different activities that the Culinary Breeding Network are up to. And so just maybe to give you a bit of overview of what the culinary breeding network do. Um, so yeah, it's centered around three core um, themes. First of all, conversations. So they do a lot of collaborative work, bringing together farmers and breeders, um, but also chefs and artists. Um, 
They also do a lot of work around explorations, and that's how they frame it, explorations of taste, the flavour wheel, but also how art can um, kind of encourage more engagement with diversity um, and help support marketing campaigns. And then celebrations. And I think Lane, who has Sicilian roots, um, draws a lot on the Sagre festivals that happen out there, but um, also hosting field days and variety show showcases. Um, so this is an image of um, some peppers uh, from one of the projects that they were um, running the Northern, that's part of the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. And um, yeah, Lane was really bringing out this idea that a lot of time breeders or growers focus on the raw taste of veg, but actually bringing in chefs can bring about new understandings of how we can work with crops. And here, so we've got the pepper, but not only raw, we've also got it roasted and sauteed and how um, bringing together conversations amongst different chefs, maybe with different cultural uh, understandings or experiences of working with food, how that can kind of bring about new understandings of the crops and the different varieties. Um, and also just with the habanero um, and yeah, I was reading about how Lane was saying that often chefs have different appreciation of not only the taste, but also the structures of different um, varieties. So for example, how to chop a pepper and ways that um, perhaps the shoulder, you want, a, you want to not, uh, you want to be able to cut through it quite quickly and not lose a lot of the, the kind of edge when you're cutting through it. So just how the, the kind of, there's a lot around the structure of veg as well as um, the taste. And alongside the conversations um, and collaborations that are very much transdisciplinary, um, I was really struck by the visual um, dimensions of the culinary breeding network and how they work with artists to really just showcase the, the beauty and the aesthetics of vegetables and, and crops. Um, and this is an image of their chicory festival and then also the tomato festival. And I think, yeah, one of the real advantages of, of working in a city like Cardiff is that there are a lot of um, artists living there as well. I guess not only in the city, it could be a rural space as well, but really trying to reach out to creative communities as well as the growing communities. So in the um, third theme um, of celebration, um, the ce cultivating celebration and diversity, uh, we were encouraged to pick a crop. Um, and also like there was a little bit of funding to support the work. And so I was trying to figure out which crop to choose. And, and I spoke to some different seed savers. I think I spoke with Kate <laughs> and Sue Stickland as well. And, the peed seemed like a really good kind of gateway um, seed to work with, partly because it's um, self-pollinating, so it's easy, it's one of the easiest uh, crops to work with. But um, also, uh, I think I'm really interested in the possibilities of plant-based protein. Um, and so peas and pulses feel like they're gonna play an important role in the future, especially localizing plant-based proteins. Um, so yeah, we went for the pea and started off, um, one of the volunteers at the garden is an artist or illustrator. And so she, um, worked to kind of create, uh, th three or four illustrations of four of the peas that we decided to focus on. So yeah, maybe I should explain. So we had two, two strands to the peas, please trials. The first strand was growing a range of peas at the garden. Um, and then the second strand was distributing pea seeds to the local community so they could then grow peas at home. And so these were the illustrations from the packets of seed that we then created. And so this is an image of the garden. So you can see we have like a number of beds with different pea varieties. Um, and um, I did want to just say, so we, we kind of wanted to showcase some of the different places where you can source seed as well. So 
we got a range of seeds from the seed cooperative, from Real Seed and the Heritage Seed Library. And in retrospect, I think, yeah, we'd probably go for a, a smaller number, perhaps, of peas, because we actually grew quite a lot of different peas. But I found that the, um, the where we had the bigger blocks of peas, that was actually much more helpful to appreciate the different stages of peas and just also to work more in bulk with like being able to harvest a bigger amount of peas than for the chefs. Um, so yeah, this was kind of the first phase of the peas please trials, just growing them. Um, and then we started um, doing some kind of observation of how the peas were growing and created like a kind of um, a form where we could look at the growing habit and kind of pest and disease, any issues, the yields, and um, more on a qualitative rather than quantitative, but that would be helpful um, to do into the future. And then also tasting them raw. And then the second, um, oh yeah, and also so there's an image of the pea packets. And we also created a little bit of um, kind of online videos to help um, both sowing peas in pots, but also sowing seeds uh, more like an allotment style, trench style growing of peas. So for those who are new to pea growing, uh, hopefully this was helpful. Um, yeah, that's, so that was uh, someone who created the poster for the um, for the festival of peas, which turned into more of an ongoing rather than a one day of hemp. Um, so yeah, the, the next strand of work was to work with some different local chefs um, and invite them to then work with the peas. Uh, so here is Vida and she has Lithuanian roots. So she actually decided to make a garden pea soup, which was shared uh, at one of the events. And some of the volunteers got involved in cooking as well as sharing. Um, and the second collaboration um, was uh, with Simon Herbivore. And he, this was actually the French beans because by the time that he was going to do the collaboration, the peas weren't available. So he did French beans. So it kind of evolved in more into a festival of pulses. Um, <laughs> But Satonji um, from the Sunshine Kitchen was actually keen to work with the peas that were a bit drier and he, he suggested sprouting them. So it was really interesting to think, although we thought, oh no, the peas are done. He was actually really keen to work with the dried peas and, and sprout them. So he created a cocoa swing curry with sprouted mung bean and garden peas, which is really tasty. Um, and then, uh, one another plot holder on the allotment is um, gets to know everyone on the local high street, and so she was keen to get involved uh, collecting recipes from the local community. And so Sue, who runs the discount superstore around the corner, shared her vegetable kebabs recipe with peas. Um, so this is a picture of her harvesting peas. And then this is uh, like a volunteer's pea recipe. So yeah, basically this, this whole strand was around hopefully creating, just asking the question of what would you do with peas? How would you cook them? And trying to um, share the different recipes. So all the recipes you, we put online now um, on the website, but also promoted through social media. Um, and then the, the final, well, another strand um, is not only, um, kind of cooking the peas, but also learning a bit more about the nutritional benefits of working with pulses. So Steph um, recently came to the garden to deliver a, a kind of interactive workshop. Um, as a dietitian, she was talking about the kind of nutritional benefits of the peas, but also show, showcasing some of the um, kind of UK grown pulses. So um, working with Vida, they created a squash um, and Carlin black badger pea soup and um, also some fava bean hummus. So it's, yeah, it feels really exciting to think about the pulses that are available through places like Hodmodods, but also thinking how could we almost bulk up the, the pulses locally as well. Um, 
And then the final um, dimension, which was more on the French, this was more on the French beans uh, moving to the pulses, but um, a few chefs kind of were invited to do some taste trials on uh, different beans that we were growing. So yeah, it feels like it, that a lot can be brought out through collaborating with chefs to kind of understand those, those dimensions of, of the crops. Um, and so I think I was just going to um, kind of wrap up by um, reflecting on, I think the learning more about the culinary breeding network and participating in the international exchanges um, really made me think about how we can collaborate with others and particularly chefs but also artists and well, just the general local community, everyone has a story uh, or a recipe that perhaps reminds them of home or um, a memorable dish. And I think it's, yeah, it feels like there's a lot of scope to open up that question about how, um, a sharing of recipes or also sharing of ways of looking at crops and and, and that's where working with artists feels like it can really help us like take a different kind of gaze or a different angle of looking at crops and perhaps that can open up a new appreciation of the crop, not only for growers, but perhaps for others who haven't thought about chicory or peas and the diversity of peas. Um, and I think in terms of next steps, um, yeah, I've really felt um, excited about the possibility of pulses and it feels like that's a kind of um, area that I'd like to explore into the future in terms of how can we grow more um, plant-based proteins particularly through pulses um, I guess from my question like in South Wales how could we grow more more pulses in South Wales and how can we work with local chefs to kind of make delicious dishes with those with those pulses um, and I guess that also means hopefully working on slightly bigger scale uh, land so having more land to grow more um, and perhaps this will probably mean more explorations around the processing and the drying of uh, the pulses so yeah that's feeling like next steps um, so yeah I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the Seeds of Remedy program um, and all the other participants on the program for um, and the speak yeah the, the culinary breeding network for uh, helping me along the journey and thanks for listening. Hello everyone, um, thanks Bobby. Um, my name's Holly, um, so this year I've been participating in the Gaia Foundation's year long seed training programme. Um, for me it's been a brilliant opportunity to expand on my seed production skills technically, but also um, kind of to delve deeper I guess into the theory and politics of our seed system in the UK. Um, and it's been really valuable in connecting me to other aspiring seed growers. Um, and there's been quite a great sense of community that's built up around the course. Um, the course has given us the opportunity to grow an annual and a biennial seed crop with the guidance and support of our regional coordinator and fellow participants. Um, and even though I'm not completely new to growing seed, going through the process um, in a really structured way and completing a crop portfolio has been really useful um, in setting best practice and affirming the importance of good record keeping. <laughs> Um, this is a bit dark, sorry. <laughs> um, so as an aspiring seed grower and plant breeder, my main interest is in diversity and returning it to our seed and food system. Um, and as well as diversity, just to add to what Poppy said, I think collaboration is really important for me as well. So whilst I was in a more traditional horticultural role, I became really interested in soil biology, specifically in terms of growing food and the role that plays in our soil health. 
in our health and our soil health. With this newfound interest, I left that role. And last season, I was based at Oxen Organics, where I was very privileged to work with and learn from Jane Arnold, who shared my interest in the soil. And we explored the importance of diversity in the microbial communities in our soil and how that could be facilitated by diverse roots in the ground. So we grew and saved seed from a vast array of cover crops, understanding that high biological diversity, both above and below ground, can lead to increased plant defense systems, increased resilience to stress, and improved crop health and nutritional quality. So this year, um, I've had another amazing experience and I've been at Trill Farm Garden, where I've been continuing my learning. Um, taking what I know, I guess, and what I've learned about diversity and these interdependent relationships and applying these ideas to seed saving. Being part of the Seed Sovereignty Programme has enabled me to explore these ideas in a nurturing space and delve deeper into some exciting um, and maybe slightly less mainstream methods of growing. So I was first introduced to the idea of growing modern land races through listening to Joseph Lofthouse speak. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of Joseph Lofthouse, but um, I'd really recommend his book. Um, I read his book and became part of a really active online community, um, international community, that was exploring diversity. I think, personally, I'd been pondering for some time whether plants have something like an instinct and a memory. The way that plants communicate with soil life, recruiting diverse microbial partners to help them thrive, it felt and indicated to me that plants have a type of consciousness and can functionally function perfectly well without interference from us humans. Indeed, our desire to control and manipulate feels like it might often present, prevent plants from fully expressing themselves, reaching their full potential in a sense. And there's just a bit of statistic that since 1900s, research has shown that we've lost some 75% of plant genetic diversity. And through lots of inbreeding and heavy selection, it's just a kind of thought that potentially we may have dumbed our plants down. This feels particularly pertinent in our organic context, where we rely on low input systems and the ability of our crops to respond and adapt to environmental challenges. Discovering the importance of genetic diversity and land race growing has been a real light bulb moment for me. So land races aren't new. <laughs> We've worked in collaboration with plants for centuries and domesticating them from their wild ancestors. We've stewarded them rather than controlled them and selected them based on very localized needs. It's how all of our crops were domesticated and how many indigenous communities still grow their food today. But as our modern food system has become globalized, it's prioritized traits of uniformity, high yields, ability to travel and increasing resistance to pathogens. We've bred these plants to meet very specific needs and it's been shown that there's been a genetic trade-off where less preferential but still vitally important traits have become less pronounced or recessive. The result is that many of our modern plants have potentially lost the genetic diversity bank to draw on and therefore the ability to learn and adapt to our really rapidly changing climate. So a general definition of a modern land race is a genetically diverse, promiscuously pollinating and locally adapted crop. Land races, land race growing involves a dynamic repooling of genetics allow new combinations of genes which match up for a new trait and allow the plants to act and respond to a new challenge. Due to the open pollination and mixed parentage, have a higher genetic diversity to draw upon to learn and adapt to environmental stimuli. And the wider the gene pool, the more resilience. Land races really appeal to me because they're not static. They're dynamic and they're collaborative. If we are to become more resilient to our rapidly changing climate, I feel we need to relinquish our control a little and work with our plant kin and allow them to express themselves and respond and adapt to survive. A kind of mutual respect, I guess. So I started my land race journey in earnest this year. My portfolio crop for the Seed Sovereignty Programme was a French bean grex. So a grex or a phlox, a phlox, a phlox, a phlox, is generally started by seeking out as much functional genetic diversity in a species, i.e. as many different open pollinated plants of the same species as possible, if that makes sense, <laughs> growing these plants together and allowing them to cross-pollinate. The result of this cross-pollination is that the next generation is essentially many hybrids, but with very diverse, not inbred parents. The grex tends to be a precursor for a land race, 
Over time, you select for desirable traits to slowly stabilize the population. And even crops like French beans that tend to self-pollinate can be grown this way, with observant growers keeping an eye out for natural hybrids. The plants are then selected based on the demands of your very local ecosystem. If they respond and thrive in your environment, they stay. Then over time, the grower begins to influence characteristics of the flock by selecting for preferential traits, such as flavor, color, disease resistance, growth habit. Saving the seed year on year enables this local adaptation to persist to the next generation and inherited microbiomes also assist in those plants thriving in your local soil. So through selection and over time, land races should become fairly stable, but really importantly, they remain dynamic. Where certain traits have been selected for, others are left to roam, avoiding genetic bottlenecks common even with some open pollinated varieties. And new varieties can introduce, be introduced to that pool at any time. So this squash land race has been selected for approximate size and taste, but the colour, shape and the other hidden traits we cannot see have been allowed to embrace their genetic diversity and do their own thing, thus the plants remain genetically different. I feel there's resilience in this diversity, but almost just as importantly, there is joy. I kind of wanted to include this anecdote because I think it captures that joy quite well. And um, in the squash patch at Trill this year, we largely grew a moray, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. It's an F1 hybrid. It's consistent, it's kind of tasty, performs quite well. Um, but we also grew this really diverse land race of maximum squash. And just casting an eye over that squash patch, we all kind of glanced at the identical rows of a moray. Didn't really think much about it. They had all grown well. There's lots of very nice looking squash, just all the same, all orange. Um, but just observing the reaction of like myself and my colleagues when we were looking at the land race, there was just pure excitement at the different colours and shapes and textures. And um, we were just wondering, kind of observing those patterns and admiring that diversity. And there was something to be said, I guess, for that sheer joy and respect and connection to our food that the like, squash brought. It kind of felt like a reciprocal relationship that empowered both the plant and the grower, allowing both to work instinctually together. So these squash, those squash were actually um, originally bred by wild mountain seeds in the US. And as part of the seed sovereignty program, international exchanges we heard from those exciting growers and seed producers, um, their backbone to their work, breeding work, is seeking out as much of that genetic diversity as possible. And they create a lot of grexes and hybrid swarms, and they've got a particularly large catalog of tomato varieties. The impact of their work on me has been huge. They responded to the challenges of the environment by allowing the plants to teach them. So they run trials and stress tests to build vigor and resilience and find the genetics that work for both the plant and for their communities and customers' needs. But I feel most importantly to me, they create exciting, stable, open pollinated varieties, but they also maintain this diverse pool of genetics through hybrid swarms that they can just dip into. And one thing that really impresses me as a grower is that their grexes and land races are often comparable to and often outperform a lot of the F1 varieties. So as well as beans and squash, I have also been experimenting with growing tomatoes, including some that have been, had some of their ancestral genetics returned to them through crossing with wild relatives, returning their promiscuous tendencies that allow the plants to cross pollinate. Um, as you can probably see, these plants display much larger flowers with protruding stigma and showy petals, attracting pollinating insects and facilitating outcrossing. It was really exciting to see bees and other pollinators just hanging around loads on these tomatoes, just yeah, having a great time. <laughs> um, so also over the past two seasons, um, I've been bricks testing a lot of these crops to gauge the impact primarily of the foliar feeds that I was doing um, to kind of indicate a very rough measure of plant health. Um, so initially started as a way of understanding of, and observing something that might represent nutritional density. Um, I bricks tested many of the tomato plants at Trill this year and consistently found that the hybrid swarms and grexes had higher bricks. The lowest was always F1 varieties. Um, I am not a scientist and these are just very crude tests but it felt reassuring and consistent to my learning that the more genetically diverse crops 
were healthier and therefore potentially better for us to eat. There's a lot more I could say about genetic diversity. Um, exciting work from people such as Emily May Armstrong and Nicole Masters on epigenetics in particular interests me. Epigenetics to me are an extra layer on top of what genes already do themselves and do not involve the altering of genetic code. I'm going a bit deep now, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so they're the connection between the genetics of the plant and what is happening in the environment. Changes in the way that the plant expresses itself are caused by stresses such as pest attack or drought. And although some of these traits might be temporary, many are inherited. So plant breeder Frank Morton, who many of you may have heard of, articulates well what this looks like with the example of two identical radish plants, one growing in paradise with no pests and the other with caterpillars chomping at its leaves. When seeds from those plants are sown, the genetics have not changed. The same genes that went into the first generation are going into the next generation, but the progeny of the chewed radish has more hairs on its leaves, so it has a better defense system, indicating that the plants do indeed, I feel, have something of a memory. And although neurons in the brain aren't involved, they're able to store and recall information using their genes. And I feel the wider the gene pool, the more potential for remembering. So I'm very much on my own learning journey, and I'm extremely grateful to have had the Seed Sovereignty Programme as part of that. It's enabled me to further my interests and push my understanding, and it's created a lot more questions. <laughs> um, that journey has also given me a perspective. I feel strongly that we've lost vast amounts of genetic diversity in our seed and therefore food system, and the repercussions of that are immense. I believe there's still huge importance in growing and maintaining open pollinated varieties that thrive in our climate and often carry forward stories and memories of a place or people. And so many fantastic things have been achieved through advancements in science and by incredible plant breeders and OPs and F1 hybrids absolutely have their place. But I wonder if we've moved maybe too far in the direction of control and inbreeding and risk losing the diversity that makes our food system so resilient. So I also believe there is room to explore a more dynamic and a more joyful way of growing food that celebrates diversity and facilitates plants broadening an adaptive memory that can make them more resilient to our rapidly changing world. And I'm sorry I read a lot of my notes, but it's quite nerve wracking being up here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Holly, and thanks, Poppy. Um, yeah, hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea of the kind of spectrum of work that we've looked at through this Seed Sovereignty Programme exchanges and so on. Um, if you're interested in, say, the learning more about the Culinary Breeding Network or uh, Wild Mounted Seeds, which were mentioned there, there are a couple of videos on the Seed Sovereignty website, which are really, really great. Worth watching them twice, actually, because you pick up bits of in, like different bits of information each time. Um, but now, shall we go on to uh, having a few questions? Are you okay to do a sort of roaming mic? Great, yeah. There's... Hi, yeah. Um, thanks for that. I've just got a question about the with I don't know if you know, but if crops are if you're getting a more diverse crop because of seed saving, do you know if there's like a way of testing the nutrients to see if we're actually getting access to more diverse nutrients in our diets? And like because I'm sure we've lost a lot from loss of diversity of crops. I'm sure we're eating way less nutrients than we would have got before. And if it, if that's like increased from doing that. And then also, um, I just wanted to ask if a crop is open pollinated, how, how you save seed if, if you want it to be the same crop as you had before and not a lumpy, bumpy pumpkin, <laughs> if you want it to be the same, is there ways of doing that? So um, the first question, I, was, I bricks test a lot of the crops that I grow, which is, I mean, I think it was initially used by beer brewers and um, people that make wine, it's, it's a test of the sugars. So it's not necessarily an indication of nutritional density, but um, my understanding of it is that it kind of gives you 
a good idea of how much your plant is photosynthesizing, so how much sugar it's producing and therefore if it's kind of doing well. Um, and just in the ways I've used it, it's generally been when I've foliar fed something just to see if there was an impact to that foliar feed. So if the bricks went up, it kind of indicated that that plant has responded to that. Um, but as I said, I was also uh, bricks testing a lot of the tomatoes at Trill this year. Um, and there did seem to be consistently higher bricks results in the crops that probably had a wider genetic diversity. So it was just quite interesting to observe that. But also, I'm not a scientist, so <laughs> these aren't really facts. You can get SAP analysis a lot of the, in the US. That happens a lot. Um, it's very expensive. So um, I know the bionutrient meter by the um, Bionutrient Association in the US is a thing that they want to have as an open source tool so people can measure nutrient density of crops more easily. But it's very much like a prototype and in progress. But um, yeah, do you want to do the open <laughs> so, do you want to do open pollinated? <laughs> um, so, there's many, many, many of our crops are open pollinated and stable. So, they, you, set, you save seed from them. All of the real seeds crops are open pollinated and you can save seed and they'll be very similar. Um, I guess what I was talking about more was um, introducing mixed parentage. So, you've got lots of different squash of the same species, um, different cultivars, um, and introducing that kind of facilitating that outcrossing that can could then basically kind of mix this stuff up in the gene pool, it introduces new combinations of genes that could offer different traits. Um, so you can absolutely save seed from all of your open pollinated varieties, but um, growing kind of flocks and grexes and, and into land race growing is a bit more about accepting that diversity and it won't you won't have a crop that looks the same that all matures at the same time that all has all of those traits that are identical but you can engineer it to have a kind of to be fairly stable to have certain traits that are important to you or your community or your customers but also being very conscious of maintaining that genetic diversity by not being too strict and letting the plants kind of do their own thing a bit more and accepting that there might be more diversity um, and ensuring that by introducing new varieties, new genetics, you're kind of keeping that pool diverse. I don't know if that answers your question. Very short and Please. Is the, sorry, all I was going to say is if you do want to keep them to not be diverse, with the open pollinated things like squash, you do have to take action to stop them crossing. Yeah. And there's lots of ways to do that. And Seed Sovereignty website would point you towards loads of information. Sorry. Thank you. That's worth saying. Yeah. <laughs> Holly's a very radical seed saver. <laughs> Not always. I really like. I she really can do like traditional as well. as well. And I, I love a lot of stable, open pollinated, but I also like to dabble and break the rules a bit. So. <laughs> we, I know we have to. There we go. Um, there's quite a lot of talk um, you see online and that about crossing squash and the risk of bitterness in the squash. Is that. Um, is that overstated? And um, is that just, I don't know what family, the gourd, what, um, what the gourds are, whether they're Pepe or Maxima, as long as you avoid that type of squash, can you cross them without the risk of um, bitterness? Or is this just an overstated ploy to stop us playing with our genes? We, we're gonna defer to Kate from Real Seeds on this. <laughs> Basically, someone imported a few years ago a job lot of courgette seed from overseas that had accidentally crossed with an ornamental gourd. It's a pepo. Um, unless you grow ornamental pepo gourds that are bitter in vicinity of your courgettes, you're not going to have a problem. And it's been massively overplayed because they were very embarrassed about having got it really wrong. And it so it's and it was a picked up as a thing, but someone imported a load of dodgy seed and it just got sold on to different places don't worry about crossing your courgettes you can cross your courgettes all you like and they will not be toxic you know, unless you grow ornamental gourds which are also pepos as well within crossing distance which i assume you won't <laughs> thank you hiya um great to hear you all speak 
Uh, I'm also really interested in land races and have kind of been struggling to find networks of peop other people who are interested in the UK. So <laughs> great, because I so I've been trying to create a Grex of French beans in the W Valley in Wales and also a Grex of fava beans. Um, and it would be really nice to link up. So you, do you know of other people as well? Have you have you started a net? Great. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> yeah. Uh there's quite uh, there's a few I'm in the southwest at the moment and there's a few of us in the southwest network that have been dabbling um and also the online community that I'm part of the growing modern land races there are a few people from the UK in that as well so um yeah it'd be great to connect brilliant Please. thank you um and also I was wondering if the exchange is happening is in, are there more exchanges happening is it a yearly thing yeah it's an annual thing and we've just started our um the exchanges for this year um so yeah come october september october next year we'll um be doing like recruiting people for it again Brilliant. and the the only thing is is you need to either have gone through our training program our year-long training program which maybe you have already. i have yeah okay well that's you're, you're there then <laughs> great or, or it's kind and of like it extends to wales as well it's yeah throughout uk yeah yeah yeah, yeah. throughout the uk um, yeah, we usually try and get a spread of uh, people from the UK and Ireland as well. Um, so, so, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was a really cool talk. Um, I, I guess I want to ask about, um, so you, you touched on how like, um, there's obviously limited organic seed available. And so like encouraging organic growers to produce their own seed is a, a really wicked thing, but also like, uh, I don't know, do you find, what's my question? Uh, <laughs> how do you kind of balance the, um, the want and the need for diversity? And um, cause I know people who've been put off uh, searching for like uh, applying for organic certification because they want to have that real community kind of like anyone bring seed and, and be really diverse. Um, so I guess, yeah, would you imagine, is there space within like the certification for like, obviously you can apply for derogation and stuff, but a kind of slightly more open, like, I guess, yeah, what's more important? Are we, are we, uh, you know, um, going for like really strictly like open pollinated seeds or are we is there do you imagine there being room for like um within the organic system being like uh this is a really important local seed and maybe it's not produced organically but uh i don't know yeah mm. there's there's a trade-off there isn't there yeah 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 i mean um just trying it's quite a complicated question <laughs> 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 just kind of um, said all my, my I mean that. my experience with um organic certification mm. boards is that they really understand that organic growers benefit from having diverse varieties that really thrive under um uh low input you know in low input sy systems mm. like ours um so it's about having like a conversation with your certification officer and saying this is from a seed swap mm. from a grower who's not certified but mm. it was grown organically and that's been very much kind of welcomed as something that's really mm. important um there are groups all around well yeah all around the uk who are involved in like commercial growers some certified some not who are involved in kind of exchange networks where so there's a group in the southwest called the southwest seed savers network who are I mean, they're a group in that they're kind of sharing, like, it's like about knowledge exchange, peer-to-peer -peer support, that kind of thing. But they also have this great spreadsheet, which is just people put up what uh, varieties they're going to grow that year. And then at the end of the year, people, well, and then people request, you know, however many grams of that seed. Mm. And then that just gets sort of sent out as a package. And it's a mixture of organic growers and non-organic growers. And it people yeah do it yeah. I mean yeah I, I think I'd, I'd be really really surprised if if um there was because, because organic growers uh routinely ask for derogations for non-organic seed which has been produced 
a very long way away mm. in a very, very different system. I'd be really, really surprised if certification officers were like, no, to locally grown, essentially organically grown mm. um, seed, which isn't certified. Does that kind of touch on that question? Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess like um, maybe it would be something about an awareness uh, to people who are, um, it's a barrier for them to get certified. Um, thinking that they could that, that it would make them much less community um, able to be yeah exchanging seeds with the community and maybe um, yeah just an awareness that there's a bit of flex with that maybe or something I don't know yeah I feel like there's a lot of space for more very like bioregional seed producers as well and mm. um, we've got like amazing seed companies in the UK but not a huge amount of them and I think there is I guess goes back to what I was saying about like very kind of bioregional local soils, mm. plants that are adapted to a very local climate that are resilient to that. If there are more smaller bioregional seed systems, that kind of creates that sense of community yeah, as well. So, yeah. cool. Thank you. Just a little bit of experience on what you were talking about seeds. Um, at my recent inspection, I'd had some seeds, you know, been swapping seed or given seed or grown seed and um hadn't asked for derogations or you know because they just come from a friend or something and the inspector was great he said now they're allowed to sign off things if they think is a reasonable mm -hmm. and because some of these were you know just seed that was going into the green manure or but the the understanding from the inspector on the day was great i don't know how they would they translate that into being able to encourage other people to join the soil association um, or become certified but it's certainly i don't feel it should be a barrier or would be a barrier for the soil association just a quick one um in, in more, my years of uh, growing um land races seems to have passed me by somehow <laughs> so a very simple question how many years does it take roughly to get a um, stable land race? I'm not there yet. So I don't <laughs> know. But Joseph Lofthouse says about six to seven years. And yeah, it's quite different for different, obviously. That, and if you've got self pollinating crops, that's opening up a whole different world of potential pain because you're like trying to facilitate outcrossings. But um, for a, like a natural um, outbreeder, then apparently six to seven years but also it depends on your your boundaries and what you would consider and it's not it's dynamic it's not a finished thing and you can always put new varieties in to jazz it up so <laughs> and I think the exciting thing about them is like wild mountain seeds they sell a lot of their kind of hybrid swarms and grexes so there's the initial start of those land races to other people to take them and do what they want with them in their space and I think that's a really great thing to have to share with other growers, just kind of dabbling in something and then sharing that. So, oh, do we have time for one more question? Uh, I think we need to be in the um, beginning so much. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for listening and asking so many interesting questions. And thank you to our speakers, Holly and Poppy. Um, and yeah, get in touch with the Seed Sovereignty Programme if you're interested in kind of exploring this work a bit more. Thanks. Thank you.